Yeah, and he's also with young people that are always in touch with them and ask nice questions. I don't know what you think it's here. I don't know, but... Oh, yeah, what do we do? Encourage me. Because... I know some professors because have this feeling how they
My dear husband uh, advertised my talk many times yesterday, I guess. Um, very happy to be here. And um, um, so let me uh, start by saying that machine learning is, uh, is not my area. It's a totally new area for, for me and my team. And I actually spent um, a decade working on making photonic devices practical, specifically nanophotonic devices, and looking into constituent materials and how we make it happen. And that's also part of the reason why uh, uh, Vlad, who is not only my dear husband, but uh, uh, a colleague, uh, told me that I would be talking about something real, because we are interested in the in realization and implementation of photonic devices, and specifically nanophotonic devices um, that provided us with uh, um, many exotic designs, um, but uh, the practical devices realm and technologies actually remain very sparse. Um, okay, so I will start today. Um, sorry, it's uh, kind of jumped several slides. Okay. I start with a few words of introduction to nanophotonics. I know you've already heard a lot about optical technologies and components at large, but why we are interested in nano and what nano means. Um, and this would connect to um, yesterday talk. And I will show you uh, my personal holistic view of where I see machine learning should and will play a critical role at which step of this photonics process, whether we should work with machines when we design structures, when we measure them, um, maybe at some other stages as well. Or maybe we can also, at some point, leverage creativity of AI if we find out what that is. Um, I will use few examples, um, and this would be examples of devices that we would really love to see entering the application realm. So we'll uh, talk about so-called matter surfaces. I will talk about some crazy potential applications for uh, space travel, for light sail, but also for emerging quantum on-chip photonics that you've already heard about. Uh, from Vlad. Um, and um, I will say a few words about materials as well, because as I said, I am a believer that wired uh, revolutions in materials are behind everything that happens in technology. So we can't avoid talking about materials, even though we are focusing on algorithms and machine learning techniques. Okay, let me start. As I said, I am a believer that it is all about materials, but materials, if we understand them very broadly, right? So we started um, with the uh, geometrical optics, lenses, and shadows um, in medieval ages. And then we went uh, to structures that are much smaller, depending on the tools that were available to us. Um, so we are dealing with uh, now uh, with uh, diffraction interference and gradings and uh, you know, microscopic uh, size devices, including fibers and waveguides. And over the past couple of decades, people, due to progress in nanotechnology, started to look into something that is much smaller than the wavelengths. And that's where very interesting stuff uh, starts. 
Um, you can think of designing optical materials um, with properties that can be tailored at will. So now you are putting nanoscale building blocks together in such a way that you create an artificial optical material, or you can utilize the nanoscale structures to make uh, nanoscale resonators or antennas that would couple to light and then enhance light matter interactions, taking hot spot resonators and both flat. And um, Andrea talked about this nanoscale resonators a lot yesterday. Okay, so plasmonics is a, um, the important part of nanophotonics, and it deals with uh, localized and propagating excitations of so-called surface plasma. So essentially, that's very simple when you have a metallic material, so where you have free electrons. Free electrons oscillate in external electromagnetic field. We have a resonance that, again, oscillates as optical frequency, but the size of the hotspot, the size of the electromagnetic field localization is defined by the size of nanoparticle, which can be you know, tens of nanometers, so there is no lens that will focus you so deeply. And uh, um, the uh, excitation of such localized resonances led to uh, the whole new era for nanophotonics, including the invention or discovery of so-called metamaterials, where you put a lot of this nanoscale present elements together, creating essentially a totally new material that can uh, you know, exhibit negative index of refraction and all that other exotic phenomena. But also, uh, most recently, a breakthrough happened when people realized that you don't need this three-dimensional stuff, which is really hard to make. It's just enough to have a transparent substrate and then put a layer, essentially it's a monolayer of resonators or antennas, and we call them matter surfaces. And depending on what kind of resonance non-antennas and resonators you put on top, you can mold the flow of light um, at, and achieve essentially whatever function you will and replace all the bulk optics that we used to have for centuries by ultra-thin elements. Another area of plasmonics still, as I said, is propagating waves, and that's the area that holds a prospect for chip scale interconnects, where you would be the diffraction limit and kind of a bridge uh, between the microscopic fibers and conventional waveguides and chip scale circuitry. Another area that I consider to be an integral part of plasmonics and nanophotonics is the emerging area, which is very exciting, and I would be happy maybe next time we'll give a lecture on the absolute new zero material, but that's the area uh, that deals with materials with a real part of the electric permittivity crossing zero. So you would say that any metal would fall into this category as well, because uh, you know, before it gets metallic with a real part of permittivity being negative, it crosses zero somewhere. But not only you need the real part to be um, at zero, you also want obviously imagine your part to be low, so that you're dealing with this effective index, which is zero. So this is very interesting. Um, it opens up new uh, chapters for nonlinear optics. Um, it actually um, provides a route to ultra-fast switching, uh, light tunneling, and many, many more. But uh, one of the most interesting and uh, technology-driven areas, um, again, as you've already seen during this school, and I would refer to yesterday's talks of uh, Andre, is matter surfaces, again, where you can put together resonators. In this example, this is uh, um, a metallic, or we would call it plasmonic matter surface that uh, uh, supports um, a creation of such a hologram. But you can also deal with dielectric uh, cavities, and this would be uh, mostly used for low loss applications, including quantum, uh, with many seminal works by Federica Capasso, Iris Hasman, Philip Alon, and many, many others. Okay. So, and this is my photonic flow tab, as I call it. Uh, every time um, you start investigating a photonic structure, whether that's for demonstrating a fundamentally new exotic effect with the matter surface, or maybe making a practical device, you always start with the concept. What is it you want? Is it an integrated wave like with a coupler, or whether it's cavity or matter surface, or maybe um, you want to achieve a bound state in the continuum um, or something like that. 
and then you go to numerical design. Um, most of us uh, don't stop at design stage, even though you see lots of papers just publishing numerical design instructions. And I will show some designs that are just numerics. Uh, very important, but what's most important is going to implementation. So you have to select the proper materials that would actually constitute your device so that you will be able to fabricate it, put it together, and ultimately test it in prototyping. The need to wait for us, uh, I don't know, there is echoing somewhere. I hope everybody is Please mute yourself, everyone. <laughs> there is some kind of yeah, feedback. Can you mute everyone? You, now I'm muted. Yeah. How I can mute them? Well, let's uh, let's see if it still matters. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So the uh, the most logical and natural way for us to think about where we work together with machines is really the numerical simulations, right? Because that's where you are using your programs or you need computational tools to actually do the design. And let me say more, again, referring to Andreas Stoke, inverse design is really computationally heavy. If you have a function you want to achieve, you have to somehow find out what structure can give you this function. And that involves uh, a lot of computational resources and time. Um, what's uh, less um, obvious or maybe less um, at, on the surface is that we are using uh, both computational resources, uh, very advanced optimi optimization and machine learning when we actually integrate and uh, devices together. Integrated circuitry, um, mask making for infographic applications, it's all about uh, putting things together in the most optimized way. Um, and that's where many group um, has actually invested a lot of efforts and there are companies doing that, largely pioneered by like Blonovich, Helena Vukovic and others. This has become a very successful area where algorithms work together with engineering input. Um, testing. So this is a very interesting area. So if you think about some areas um, that are well related to optics, uh, for example, uh, image, uh, or image recognition or imaging. Um, algorithms has been used in image recognition forever, right? So uh, image recognition from sparse data or enhancing the spectral signal as again we learned yesterday. That's where it's very instrumental. But I would like to uh, say more um, and um, actually amplify a point that gladly, because I will mention this uh, uh, evidence for quantum measurements one more time today, we are in the era where we're dealing with nanoscale structures and we're applying them for merging quantum on-chip circuitry, which means that inherently we are working with very low intensity signals that are coming from quantum emitters so maybe that's a light just um, over a single photon, or it's uh, you know two entangled photons, and it's very sparse because you just want to find one emitter on your substrate, and that's it. So you will not be able to uh, recognize the useful signal from quantum emitter without spending you know too much time on and doing complex quantum optical measurements. So it's really crucial in this point to actually implement uh, machine learning here. And um, less obvious part um, is to use machine learning not only to tell us which geometry or shape or architecture we have to choose for our functionality, but also to tell us what kind of um, materials would actually give you the best performance. And this is something that I see as a future. We are not there yet. But ultimately, you want your algorithm to tell you, OK, to achieve this functionality, you should take you know, a silicon nitride membrane and make a uh, crystal out of it, or a high index dielectric um, or metal and make a matter surface that would perform like that. So this would be our ultimate goal. Um, and um, we actually have to work with uh, um, well, actually, I'll need some people to achieve that. Okay, um, so I'll go one by one through those parts today and uh, see where we are and what kind of uh, things uh, we have already shown and achieved. 
Uh, I'll start with the concepts. So as I mentioned, concepts are very different. So and in principle, it doesn't really matter what you have in mind. You always start uh, with uh, design. Um, and in design, um, usually when you start numerical simulation, you're always um, using some kind of a priori knowledge. So it's your engineering input, right? If it's a matter surface, you start with a, a cavity that has, let's say, a cylindrical size. Uh, or if it's a photonic crystal, you start to vary the size of pillars. Um, so simple shape variation is what you know, most students will go through when they start numerical design. Um, and then if it's not enough, you do more complex optimization and machine learning later on. So simple shape variation um, sounds very simple, but we should not underestimate the power and the beauty of simple shape variation because all the beautiful effects of photonic crystals come simply by varying the shape. Right? because it's an interference effect, and you can get very interesting phenomena emerging. Um, also, the same for matter surfaces. For example, a very interesting bound state in the continuum also could arise in a very simplistic structure like this in dielectric pillars, uh, where you just play around with the size of dielectric pillars. Um, very interestingly, um, and I just want to flash this uh, single slide here that indeed, uh, this is, that was our stellar um, postgraduate student um, Shaima, uh, whom you cannot see because <laughs> um, and, and she came up with the design of titanium dioxide pillars um, and showed that if you can uh, vary the size of it, you will get a very interesting behavior um, that supports so-called uh, exotic bound state in the continuum state. But these were all, uh, would be all intuition-based matter surfaces, whether it's a grading, uh, BICs, um, all dielectric uh, matter sources or subways gradings, they are all based on some kind of prior design. So in most cases, that's not enough. No matter how much you weigh the shape, you will not improve your functionality too much. So that's why uh, people are using more complex tools to actually advance and solve an inverse problem. So you have a functionality, and then you can use either evolutionary or gradient descent based optimization to find out what kind of structure can give you this performance. So um, what I would like to use as an example for this particular um, part is energy, because energy is one of the um, engineering challenges of our century. And whatever technology you take, we are trying to see what we can do for sustainable energy. Um, the same goes for matter surfaces. And these are, some, these are very powerful um, optical components um, that can um, also help us uh, with energy harvesting uh, techniques. So this is just an example of designing game, very intuitive matter surfaces um, that can help you to boost the absorption of uh, sunlight. So in black is uh, uh, sun radiation, and then in red is absorption of the structure that you can design in a very simplistic way. So let me just say a few words about, this is a very famous so-called gap plasma configuration. So you see many groups, including my former PhD advisor, Sergei Bozhevolny, who spent a lot of time showing very interesting structures based on that uh, concept. So you have a metallic mirror here, um, dielectric spacer, and then a plasmonic antenna on top. What this structure promotes is really high field localization in the gap, and that's where the enhanced light and matter interaction can also drive different processes, including um, uh, really enhanced light absorption. Um, now, even on this slide, I would like to make a point that no matter how good your design is, if you don't take into account um, the practical constraints of your device, it's all in vain. Why? Because if you imagine that this matter surface is going, to, is going to absorb the whole solar radiation spectrum, it is going to be heated up. So people who design the structures with gold and silver are doomed because everything would be either melted or the shape would change and you lose your functionality. So the key point here before you start the designing of the structures 
um, is to choose the right material. So my group spent more than a decade working on so-called ceramic plasmonic materials, which means that they would uh, mimic uh, metallic behavior as noble metals, um, but they would be high temperature stable. So we have to always keep this um, in mind. And example of such materials would be transition metal nitrite. Titanium nitrite or zirconium nitrite. I will um, talk a little bit more about it later. We are expanding the concept of just a light absorber. Again, it's an intuitive design to so-called solar thermal photovoltaic concept. What that is, instead of just using a photovoltaic cell that absorbs light, first, you design um, an absorber that essentially absorbs either all solar radiation or just use heat from any heat generator. It can be anything. It can be a gas burner, it can be a radiative cell, it can be sun. But you design your emitter in such a way that it re-emits radiation in a narrow band so it matches the radiation of PV cell. So your PV cell is not absorbing solar radiation where there is a lot of uh, loss of photons. Rather, it absorbs something that your emitter emits. So it's like reshaping um, of the spectral um, response and that would boost potentially your efficiency. So TPV concept has attracted a lot of attention because, um, and again, theoretically, you can go to really high efficiencies. Um, and uh, high temperature stable matter surfaces uh, that are based on the same gap configuration can also work as really efficient emitters. One more time, we have to remember that it is a multi-constrained, multidisciplinary problem of optimization. Not only design, but your material, your stability, your mechanics, the temperatures, and everything have to be taken into account. So just restating the problem, you have any heat source, you have selective emitter, all your emission should be reshaped in such a way that it is very effectively absorbed by the PV cell. So let's look at the conventional PV cell. So this is gallium antimonide photonic uh, or uh, photovoltaic cell. This is a working band. The first thing you see is that in order to have a decent overlap between your emitter radiation, so it's such a black body, and the PV cell, the temperature has to go up. So at least 1500. Um, there is no optic so far that can go near these temperatures. And the only answer to that would be refractory or high temperature stable materials, including those nitrate that we are working with. And then what you want to do is, um, is match, uh, is optimize uh, emitter in such a way, this is an ideal emitter, that most emission happens in band and then you suppress everything out of band. So you don't have red part which goes to heat and the green part is optimized. Um, there have been many groups um, that try to implement TPV designs, um, so including um, these intuitive designs and also very similar con concept by Gennady uh, Schwitz on the narrow band thermal emitter. We started our search uh, also with simplistic geometry because that's where you always start with. Maybe we thought just changing the size as in photonic crystals would give you some nice functionality. Well, it turned out that, well, you don't have enough degrees of freedom. Even though you try to play around with sizes, you don't get um, a lot of enhancement in band. So we have to go to more complex optimization tools. Um, and we went um, and used uh, something that proven to be very successful in many areas of photonics called topology optimization. So this technique is inherited, in fact, from um, the area of civil engineering. And in the civil engineering, topology optimization has long been used to um, optimize the distribution of material, the real material in space, for building bridges and aircrafts. So what would provide the most stability, for example, and uh, uh, less mass. Um, pioneered by uh, Ole Zygmunt from Technical University of Denmark, Elie Blonovich, Shan Hu Fei, Lenvukovic, and many others. Uh, people have applied it to design photonic crystals, waveguide components, matter surfaces of very unusual shape. These are on orthodox. It's not something that you would come up with yourself, right? It's something that you get, um, the inverse design can uh, give to you and give this optimized performance. 
So I will talk about the challenges later on, but even though this optimization technique works really nicely, it's still computationally heavy. What's most important is that um, it actually um, has no hyperdimensionality, which means that changing just one parameter um, means uh, that's the only thing you can do. You cannot include like both thickness and shape. It would be too computationally heavy. And it also searches for local maximum minimum. And for the entire community and my entire talk, one take one message that I would like you to have is that we are interested in finding something that would at least look like a global optimization, right? You want to have your global maximum, global minimum, like, you know, ground state for your optimization problem. And um, uh, topology optimization, even though really beautiful, uh, you can play around with shapes, and I wouldn't go into details, we have just adopted it from what Ole Zygmunt did. We applied it to the concept of this matter surface, starting with a quasi-random distribution. You optimize your figure of merit, whatever you choose as a figure of merit for your device. In this case, it's just the in-band absorption to out-of-band reflectivity. Um, you put some constraints, um, Again, Andrea mentioned how important it is to make sure that the structure can be fabricated and they have a tolerance to fabrication imperfections. Um, and then you can see some improvement from cylindrical design, uh, definitely. Um, so all this work, uh, including machine learning part, uh, has largely been driven by our stellar postdoc, Jacques Solokudyshev, uh, whom you can't see, uh, but he's done <laughs> all the work. Um, okay, so um, another crazy uh, project that we are part of um, where optimization is crucial is so-called breakthrough initiative um, where our team is part of a so-called um, light sail initiative. So um, this is a crazy idea to actually send a light sail to the nearest Earth-sized planet, uh, Alpha Centauri. And uh, oh, by the way, there is a separate prize, one million dollar for the message that we're going to send. I, I'm not sure whether they already announced the winner or not, but they're running it. Okay, so it, imagine this is, uh, uh, you know, Mission Impossible close to. So there are many teams, international teams working on three parts of it, creating laser arrays on Earth to actually launch the light sail, uh, communication arrays, and then the light sail itself. So it would be propelled by uh, solar radiation. So how this light cell should be built. So our team on light cell design is uh, um, led by Harry Atwater at Caltech. And uh, people have already spent a lot of time looking at all possible concepts and membrane, internal crystals, uh, foams, uh, matter surfaces that could actually propel the development of, um, of a light cell that would be um, highly reflective, very uh, low weight, but also have very high uh, mechanical stability. So there are so many things in play. This is our very humble contribution. So this is just to show you that topology optimization can be instrumental everywhere, but this is just a single small step. Um, so what we started with was a silicon membrane, and you just uh, have a, like a meta grade. And our question was, okay, just by optimizing, can we find some design that would have um, proper um, characteristics? So the total mass um, is what you need to uh, minimize and refle reflection is what you have to optimize. So there are some designs um, that, you know, the topology optimization will give you with some, you know, uh, decent parameters. And again, you have to take into account all the constraints of uh, fabrication uh, and so on. The third example is on-chip quantum circuitry that you learned about yesterday. Um, the cornerstone of uh, quantum uh, photonics on a chip and all the uh, emerging technologies, sensors and communications, is really creating a um, source of single photons, deterministic, indistinguishable, and paving the way to the creation of entangled photons, but it has to be integrated, highly efficient, high quantum purity on a chip. So there are so many different um, approaches right now. And it's, if you look at them, so there's some of them, or most of them with uh, two-dimensional materials uh, like hexagonal boron nitride come from Igor Haronovich, but also from Helena Vukovic and others. 
um, you see that people are integrating dissimilar structures together. This would be both dissimilar materials and dissimilar geometries. So you have 2D material, you have to locate quantum emitter there, you have to maybe put a dielectric cavity around it, and then you have to efficiently couple it to the waveguide. Um, so again, just an example, um, not only you need to know what kind of shapes would give you um, optimal performance, but you also would like to know what kind of architecture would be best. So um, this is just an example of uh, advanced optimization of uh, quantum emitter, which sits um, in the layer of hexagonal boron nitride. You can either put it on top of silicon nitride waveguide or sandwich in, in between, and silicon nitride is seen as one of the uh, most promising platforms for both integrated optics and uh, emerging quantum photonics. And um, you can compare these um, architectures in terms of efficiency and how effectively your light from the uh, emitter couples um, into the waveguide, um, selecting well the embedded structure. And what's also important is that uh, topology optimization can help you to choose um, the right structure so that it would be less sensitive to the position of emitter. Everyone working in the quantum field knows that deterministic position of quantum emitters is a big, big challenge. So um, it's really hard to put it exactly where you want it. So it has to be um, very robust towards um, um, movements of the emitter. So it's great, but one more time, it's time consuming. Um, importantly, it gives you local maxima almost in all cases. You start with a random yes, and the beautiful topologically optimized structures would give you performance that would fall into this local maximum. So instead of doing that, as I said, we want to uh, have a global solution. What you can do is you can select uh, this uh, local maximum and then have a neural network or some other algorithms to look at this local maximum and say, hey, I know how to converge and find the global one. And that's the idea behind using machine learning techniques. Uh, machine learning techniques have been uh, applied in photonics already in many, many areas. One uh, challenge of this field, and the biggest one, is that in order to use um, any algorithm successfully, for, for example, for inverse design, you need big training sets. And um, there is a lot of skepticism in this area. Why on earth I would use machine learning if I can generate a large enough training set, I can simulate everything and do direct optimization and find the best design that is good enough. It is a good question, and I would repeat that we are interested not only in speeding things up, but really in finding a global solution which might be hard to achieve just with classical um, optimization techniques. Um, so we have tried uh, to um, look into existing algorithms first with the idea of both speeding things up looking into global uh, maximum, but also, um, in principle, giving us the opportunity to um, extend the running space. Not only shape, but maybe thickness. So, so we started with a simple uh, generative at the serial networks. Everyone starts with GAN. Whoever works with machine learning starts with GAN. You have a bunch of images. In our case, it's a highly optimized uh, meta surfaces. And then you have a, a generator that generates um, data uh, or meta surface designs that uh, look similar to training sets from random noise. And discriminator is trying to discriminate between real and fake images or efficient, non efficient, they compete. And that's how training is performed. Um, gain in time is enormous, so you uh, spend around uh, 50, 100 hours generating 200 designs. Using topology optimization, you spend less than a minute for thousands of design with machine learning. Of course, you have to check because uh, the black box can give you something crazy. So you have to check that these are real, uh, highly efficient matter surface designs. So you run them through a few iterations of direct optimization, and then you can expand your training set by feeding them back. Uh, now, I can speak more about how we expand the training set uh, from you know, hundreds of design a little later. But what I wanted to show to, um, late, uh, now is that um, GAN is just the first step. In most cases, 
especially if you want to perform more optimized search and find the outliers that are slightly outside your trading set because that's what you want. Um, you have to go to adversarial or, um, order encoders or variational order encoders to reduce the dimensionality. By reducing the dimensionality, um, you will be working in so-called uh, Latin space, um, and this was just a compressed representation of geometrical and optical features. Instead of working with these images themselves, you compress it down because, again, this optimizes the search. So um, adversarial autoencoder combines uh, the VA and GAN to some extent in such a way that you can impose some restrictions on the Latin space as well. So we'll not go into details here, but um, um, this, um, uh, these techniques uh, gives you both the speed up when you reduce the dimensionality, but also allows you uh, to apply some uh, restrictions into the Latin space and see some patterns that would help you to find more optimized designs. So um, uh, just intermediate um, achievements uh, with machine learning techniques here. So direct topology optimization, um, as I said, can take you hundreds of hours uh, to get a uh, hundred design. And then if you apply fully um, algorithm based approach, you go down to minutes. The best results, though, in terms of efficiency, are achieved when you combine machine learning uh, technique uh, to generate design, and then you do just a couple of iterations of direct optimization. Then this would be best. But if you want to get rid of direct optimization altogether, you have a question? Yeah, I'm curious, how should we read the y-axis on the left graph? It seems to be closer to the hour. Oh, I didn't get it, sorry. If I look at the y axis of the last figure, yes, uh, the hours seems to be close to like 30 hours, so like two minutes. Well, uh, it's not in scale for sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not in scale. I guess, uh, yeah, you're right. If you look here, it's close to 30 hours. But, uh, oh, here, yeah, thank you. See, for the green, for the green one, it's 10, 1000. You are very attentive. That's what, you know, I don't see it because I, I trust my postdoc and, and that's why I get the chance. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, uh, you know, if you just get rid of any direct uh, solvers in your approach, then you go to minutes. And, you know, in some cases you say, okay, I can spend a couple of hours and it's, uh, it's not a big deal and improve it just a little more. Um, and uh, you get the same uh, results for um, other techniques. So you can apply similar uh, technique to improve the designs of your gradings. For the, so this is a grading for light cell. Very interesting thing, if you apply machine learning uh, to um, light cell design, you converge actually to simple structures. If you compare with topology of my structures, they were more like elaborate. And here it's actually uh, becomes more simple, um, uh, which tells you that sometimes engineering intuition is actually enough. Just make it ready. Okay? Don't sweat the small stuff. But anyway, that's not the point. That's, uh, um, now I'm coming to you, I would say, the most exciting um, direction that we are undertaking now. And that comes back to what I already said about global um, solution. Uh, so very natural question is, again, why if we have good solvers, just take a supercomputer and run all this um, direct simulations or direct optimization and if the performance will be good enough. In order to explore really um, global optimization solutions, what we have to do, we believe, is to actually leverage advances in emerging quasi and true quantum simulators. So, um, and the idea behind is the following. Instead of just taking the photonic optimization problem and just running a bunch of algorithms on your trading set, um, you, because you will never be sure that your solution will be outside the trading set, right? It's a supervised machine learning. Instead, you try to encode your problem into a physical system, into a physical system of, say, coupled qubits, like an integrated machine, and then just let it 
say and propagate relax to ground state, and then read it back. If you read back the ground state of the physical system, it's like an analog computing, it's in the ground state, it's a minimum, right, of energy. You read it back, it's a global minimum of your optimization problem. So that was the idea behind our collaboration with uh, Sabri Kais, who does uh, quantum algorithms and largely done by our student uh, Blake Wilson, is to now um, map our highly constrained optimization problem, which is this matter surface, is the same example, um, into the physical system, into d wave machine. It's, I know, it's not, you know, fully quantum computer, but we wanted to see whether that's possible. And um, in order to do that, um, we mapped our problem into so-called Cuba. Cuba is a quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, and which is an example of the problems that are really hard to solve on classical computers. And uh, examples of such problems would be MaxCat or optimizing the travel uh, salesman um, pathway. So um, the idea um, again behind is if we are able to encode our optimization problem as Cuba, that has one-to-one -one mapping into Ising modal Hamiltonian, we will be able to encode it in the physical system because your um, coefficients would actually be giving you the local field values applied to each qubit and the coupling between them. If you know that you encode it and then you actually apply some alien techniques so that it goes into the ground state. Now, um, it looks like a good idea. Just take a physical system, encode it there, and look at the ground state and read it back. It's not easy to implement. First of all, I mean, you're dealing with pictures, right? You have to get rid of pictures and go to binary vectors. These are ups and downs, right? So you have to first encode it in such binary vectors. Then, since you have figure of merit in, um, correspondence for each metasurface design, um, you will uh, have then correspondence between a binary vector collection and your figures of merit. The next thing is something that algorithm people and mathematics people have to do, and um, that's uh, my simple understanding of that. Um, essentially, you are finding this correspondence between the binary vectors and, for, and the assigned uh, figures of merit by training the so-called factorization machine. And so this is a regression model. And you retrieve parameters um, of this model. And these parameters, as I already mentioned, would later just define the parameters that you apply field to log qubit and the coupling between them. So um, this is the flow of the process. Again, you can't see Blake, even though he did all the work and working really hard, and then he explained everything to me. Um, so um, the first step is very critical because the ability to convert whatever problem or training set you have into a set of binary vectors is not easy. You lose a lot of information here. And you have to reduce dimensionality, otherwise you won't be able to import it in any of the quantum simulator. Um, but at the same time, you have to be careful not to lose you know, too much of information. Um, and then um, this uh, mapping uh, the binary compressed space into the Cuban model. Um, so you get your coefficients and then you do the embedding these parameters into the solver itself. Important takeaway, if you have questions about the technicalities of, and I didn't play in a D wave machine, Blake did, and Blake would be very happy to talk about it, but my point would be here on this slide. If you look at the distribution of the um, efficiencies for different training, uh, for the training set in blue, so this is a number of different designs with different efficiencies. In red, you will see the designs that um, this uh, abelian on D-Wave gave you. So you see, this would be the highest intensity designs, and they are somewhat outside the training set. So 
I'm not saying that we proved that D-Wave machine outperforms classical algorithms. We don't do any benchmarking. You can, you know, you can send the whole life benchmarking algorithms against each other. We don't want to do that. We have an indication that the solvers can actually uh, bring you outside of the training set closer to a high performing solutions. And you have the same um, for the grading. So the next big thing, if you ask me, is to really to leverage uh, real quantum simulators and uh, like the one that uh, our team led by Misha Lukin has with Rydberg Adams. And in fact, Blake is right now sitting in Boston working with Sierra company. And they are trying to actually find a good photonic problem that uh, we would be able to import on um, the quantum simulator. Now, the challenge is it's not a universal quantum computer, which means that we are not able to solve any problem. So to really show the advantage and that we get this global solution to and get solutions that we would never get otherwise in photonics, we have to first formulate problem that can be solved on this particular quantum simulator. Um, but nonetheless, it is very exciting because, um, again, it gives you... What is the typical size? Why do you I will have to double check that because we played with many. It depends on how much you compress into the binary vectors. And again, depending on um, uh, the set and how much information you want to lose or not lose, it varies a lot. And that's uh, one of the major drivers. The order. Are we talking about hundreds? Um, less. Um, well, actually hundreds or about hundreds, I would say, not more, because otherwise it becomes, yeah, it becomes too, too big. Yeah. We try to reduce it even more, but then it's, uh, it's definitely so much loss of functionality that you can't deal with that. Um, and yeah, and then it's, it, it's a problem. But and not all photonic problems can be reduced to Cuba, and Cuba cannot be uh, mapped, for example, to pure solver. Um, in the way we did it with DWA. So we have to come up with a completely different system for that. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, and in the remaining time, um, I wanted to um, just go briefly through the testing, and I'm sure that Vlad showed it before, um, but just to remind you one more time that when we are putting things together, not only optimized uh, designs would matter, but also the way uh, you integrate components together, um, and also how good you are in actually ultimately rapidly prototyping um, everything. Um, and uh, here, and again, I would uh, flash this really quickly, um, single photon emitter characterization is essential, right? In order to put everything together, you, you first have to find what emitters are good and which ones has a high quantum uh, purity. Um, so that, um, for example, with having uh, thousands of emitter on your surface, instead of feeding on each emitter for a really long time, for you know, several minutes, 20 minutes, um, you can take a really uh, fast measurements and then train your uh, binary classifier that with high fidelity will tell you whether this is a meter that emits a single photon or not. So, and I'm sure that Vlad uh, told you about the characterization of single emitters where you're collecting the second order autocorrelation function and uh, finding the uh, autocorrelation function value at uh, zero delay time that has to be uh, below one half for the good emitter and above uh, for the bad emitter. So classifiers are able to actually um, recognize good and bad emitters from really sparse data training set, which means that if you have a substrate, or better, if you have a um, two-dimensional material that you want to characterize, you can, um, in fact, do real-time scanning um, of uh, your fluorescent defects or emitters, and in real time perform this quantum materials metrology. Um, it was a good point made uh, by you, Andrea. I'm referring to it talk many times, but because ultimately we want to see things, so we want to convert whatever we do 
into uh, imaging, and this technique can also be combined with imaging. So you overlay the photoluminescence map with the uh, G2 um, at zero time delay map, and then you can actually get a higher resolution. Fabrication and integration step is also something that you are um, leveraging the advances in topology optimization and uh, machine learning. So just imagine that uh, you have a quantum emitter that you can now, um, in a fast way, find your deterministically place in uh, your cavity design. You design the cavity, you design the emitter in the way that I showed, and you put everything together and ultimately uh, enabling uh, not only the quantum device optimization, but also assembly, quantum imaging, and maybe even sampling of uh, normal quantum materials. And um, I don't know when I started, there is uh, five minutes to 10, but I wanted to flash um, my favorite part before I uh, finish, because as I said in the very beginning, I do believe that materials would stay foundational for any technologist. And that's why we ultimately will have to leverage advances in algorithms and combine them with our um, understanding and knowledge of material platforms. And right now in this field, we are actually in a situation where we have access and luxury to use materials with refractive indices or dialectic permittivities that range from high index dielectric to metals that has a real part which is uh, negative, but also with materials with, uh, that have a refractive index, um, which is really, really low. What's most important, and this, this would be like a challenge for those who wants to include some hyperdimensionality of materials in machine learning algorithms, we know how to tailor these materials. The, the dielectric permittivity is not just a constant any longer. We spend a long time as a community developing materials that can be tailored. So materials that we are using, say, for the same metal surface, as I showed, for titanium nitride, this is the same material, but you can make it less uh, and more metallic. And you can tailor uh, dielectric permittivity in a certain range so it becomes a parameter um, together with your geometrical size. So this is very interesting. Um, this is actually very different for those working with uh, nanophotonics. It's different from metals. Metals cannot be tuned, um, but uh, plasmonic materials such as titanium nitride can be. And another thing is that they grow with taxol, so it's really smooth lace. You can make really um, thin um, layers that are atomically flat. I already mentioned epsilon E zero material, and this would be the whole range of different oxides and dot semiconductors that also have highly tailorable properties. So again, imagine in your uh, algorithm of black boards, you, you will have to say, again, you know, we don't have a really restriction on dielectric permittivity. It is also a parameter in my optimization scheme so that I can go, uh, you know, from being positive to being negative. Uh, crossing the zero region, and it's not um, a, a point that you have to discard or disregard because zero is a singularity, you want to avoid it in any optimization, but it shows that in real materials, we actually could have a regime uh, which is as exotic as that zone is zero, and uh, we might even have some new physical insights if we combine it with optimization techniques. Um, so lots of materials available to us to actually introduce into our optimization. Um, one of the interesting um, areas that uh, my team is also working on is so-called transdimensional materials. And this is yet another interesting area that could feed into expanding the parameter space for our optimization. So essentially it's in between 2D and 3D. It's not conventional thin films, but it is a few atomic layers. It's a few atomic layers of a material that has metallic properties that is shown to have thickness dependent optical properties that where, again, not only you're changing the thickness in your optimization, you know that this changing thickness your optical response will be changing, which is very interesting 
uh, thing, and that opens up a new dimension for both uh, dynamic control of your function, but also for um, optimization. And then um, to mention more, this is uh, very physics rich. Now I'm just advertising other fields that we are doing. And, and this transdimensional material actually has, uh, um, they provide extremely high light enhancement um, so that you can drive very exotic physical phenomena in this regime, including uh, excitation of forbidden transitions and enhancement of indirect transition in semiconductors and also very, very high uh, tunability. Um, last time I gave this talk about transdimensional materials and how we want to tune them, someone approached me and said, well, but you're forgetting about all the 2D materials, and I am not forgetting about 2D materials. Moreover, we are working with the team that pioneered um, the discovery of this uh, MXC material, so it's actually a family of 2D materials um, that are built of, of, of metal um, and uh, um, either carbide or carbon nitride, and there is a lot of uh, flexibility in choosing your material as well. So I believe that the next step for the entire community in photonics would be to leverage the existing databases for material that we have, for tailable material together with algorithms, and put it all together in such a way that ultimately we will also get insights into physics. So physics-driven algorithm would be the next step for us as a community. We have to work with algorithm people so that we can inject some physical understanding, not only in the creation of the training set, but also in the algorithm itself, but also potentially learn um, from the outcome of the black box about new effects that we haven't seen before. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the entire Purdue team, um, and thanks for attention. Thank you, Sasha. Yes. Yes, thank you. Exciting, exciting talk. Um, I have a question about lighting. Also, can you ask a few more words about the actual problem? You know, you get the size, the mm -hmm. variables, the type of the problem, the street continuous constraints, yes. the signature, order, you know, just to fix the understanding. Yes. Um, so, uh, as I said, um, it is, let me go back and I show you. Okay, maybe here. Um, so there are many um, inputs. So it is like uh, if you if you're talking about optimization problem, it has many targets. So the targets that, for example, uh, we were looking at, we were trying to have two targets for our optimization. So one target would be high reflectivity. It has to be above uh, ninety-six percent. And another one was mass. It's less than two grams per um, 10 square meters. So 10 square meters, uh, less than two grams, reflectivity as high as possible. Better like uh, 98%. So um, in addition to that, so this is what's only our contribution. Um, teams uh, by Perry and Arthur Davian, who's doing a lot for light sale, they also included here uh, mechanical stability because you can imagine that whatever happens. So this is also very crucial. We also have some design of this. So ultimately it has to be three to start with. So mechanical stability, mass, and reflectivity. Um, in addition to that, you will have to take into account um, like overall robustness against the environment. So right, you have um, what would be the temperature of the light cell? How would the properties um, of the light cell material change while this propagation happens? Um, Doppler effects and all the things have to be taken into account. So as I said, now I would say these are really like a baby steps that several teams are making. So right now, uh, what people are trying to do is down-select 
um, architectures and materials. So it looks, for example, like a silicon membrane um, is a good candidate. Um, metallic structures, probably not, because they will not be able to provide us uh, with the required reflectivity due to absorption and um, um, satisfy the mass requirement. So, or like, uh, yeah, membranes and photonic crystal based membranes would be uh, um, some of the approaches. Harry Edwards. Um, paper uh, deals, and he specifically talks about, you know, the several constraints and uh, this graph that I showed on uh, like You haven't tried to map this into people? No, 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 yeah, I think so. I think so because, um, yeah, again, it's, uh, this is too much. Um, and uh, I think the first step would be to narrow down the selection. If we know this, okay, now we know that stability, mass, and reflectivity are met by membrane made of the crystal, then we can play with that, but it's too early. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Steve? Uh, uh, so, what I you to ensure that I know the because I think you mentioned that if you use the uh, Yeah, so uh, you see, this, that's the whole point. We, we would never uh, be sure that with classical algorithms, you achieve the global solution. So we can only compare with what we have in the training set and what you get. Um, some classical algorithms would be better than the other. For example, again, GAM is not good at finding anything global. Why? Because GAM looks at what's available in the training set and make something very simple. Um, adversarial audit order in this way would be, or could be better. So you are interested in outliers. So you have your training set, um, but you are interested in something which has a high efficiency but does not necessarily belong to the training set. That could mean that this is a global solution which is uh, more accessible so far with an error of solar. Um, so again, right now it's just uh, you know looking at the distribution of the training set and what you get that gives you indication that you are closer to global solution. But the true global solution, and you know mathematicians can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that if you do the proper mapping into the physical solver, like this pure Rydberg atom system. And then um, it goes into the ground state because that's a minimum of your XD. And then you read it back, this would be your global, uh, your global solution. We hope so. <laughs> yeah, actually, for this really looking up, I actually have a related question. I was wondering how you, you pick your algorithm to all the particular problems and so on, for such a sparse data set. And maybe you can even find an algorithm that picks the right algorithm so that you can. Yeah, and we, yeah, it's a good question. You know, someone asked me, and then uh, it, it goes back to uh, like, because it's, it is all uh, supervised machine learning, right? You show something to your algorithm, and then it spits out something similar. So the first uh, challenge would be to see what if you just um, give like a really loose problem. You say, okay, you have all possible designs and I want to achieve this function. Is there an algorithm that without any, let's say without even training set to give you something? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it but looks deep, really... Huh? Deep, deep, deep mind. Yeah. Examples when they learn chess or go without playing with others. Just yeah. So like it's a, again, it's the next step. So how we select it again, just by you start with uh, simple steps. You select algorithms that are already out there, like in a game or uh, uh, a serial or in order, and you see which one performs better. 
But there are several uh, tricks that you have to be aware of. Again, some algorithms would be just essentially repeating your training step, which is not fun. Um, and some algorithms would be better in finding solutions that are different than your training set. Um, here, what I would like to um, stress on the time, I mentioned it at the very end, but I do believe that um, we have to work with the uh, algorithm people because if we have no knowledge about algorithm, and if this algorithm could be, let's say, adjusted to your problem, and I would call it physics in home, machine learning, this would be much more efficient. Right now, we use um, physics inside only at the creation, step of the creation of the training set. The training set, you can, uh, you can only calculate maybe 200 of designs, but then you can expand it to 10,000 by simple, simply by injecting physics into it. Because you know that they are robust, so you can dilate them a little bit, they would still be high efficiency designs. You can use symmetry and other things to expand it. Um, and we would like to use the same type of uh, physical insights in your algorithm. So just to give you an example, for the nanosurface design, you have all these features, you have small features, corners. You compress it to lab space, and maybe your algorithm in the, in the compressed space, you start to see some grouping. This feature gives you this feature in the spectral uh, region, right? And in order to achieve this spectrum, you have to be somewhere and in, in, in here. So this clustering, for example, can give you back some insights about physics, maybe new resonances in the structure that you've never seen before. And um, so this like dialogue between an engineer and the algorithm is necessary, but it's hard for us to do that because we are not machine learning scientists, right? It has to be physics informed algorithm, and that's why I believe that uh, we have to work with algorithm people on that. Physics informed computer scientists. Physics informed computer scientists. I have a question too. Like, so when you once you use it and you have your designs, you need to fabricate them, right? But they have really, really small features. Can you actually fabricate them that accurately? Right. Like how much that if you fabricate them, they will look slightly different? Do they yes, are, are they they actually will. like tile? Yes, they will. So, um, two things here. Uh, first one is that in the very first topology optimization step, um, you put constraints on the smallest feature dimension. So we always disregard feature sizes that are less than 40 nanometers, means that it can be fabricated. The second point, which is most important, and again, that I talked about it, is tolerance. You can compare your algorithms and your approaches and how tolerant they are um, for like um, perturbations of the sizes. So we make sure in our topology optimization that if you change the size slightly, then the performance won't change too much. So it's stable. The stable and tolerance um, level is what you check at the optimization stage. And if all your sets are checked for minimal feature size and for tolerances, then you kind of um, on a safe side of this fabrication. You can still go wrong, I can tell you, but uh, you will be on the safe side. Okay, I think it's time for us to move. Uh, let's Thank you. Again. Remember that you can ask questions during coffee break, and, uh, and our next speaker is Ted Ruffin, okay. please. Okay, and uh, he is, can I say, from New Generation. So don't let down your generation. Oh my god. Lots of pressure, huh? Oh my god. <laughs> okay. The, the pointer is wrong. So, uh, I, ah, so have, is it I have a pointer, but I don't find you're welcome to use this one. Oh. No, yeah, I think I just need to... Uh, 
No, because well, it's, it's yours. It's mine, yeah, it's because I don't know this one is not working. Oh, oh laser. just so it's a laser? Yeah, just a laser. Yes, yes. Just a laser, breathe it. Sure. I think I would like to stay there, but <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> 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 Okay, so let me keep getting stable. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> good morning, uh, everyone. Ah, no, no problem. <laughs> good morning, everyone. My name is Pedro Freire. I'm a third year PhD student in Astor University with Sergei Turitsin as my supervisor. And today I will be sharing. Uh, a little bit my two years and a half experience on, on this field of applying deep neural networks in optical communications. Uh, and not only that, uh, I will try to give some, some hints on the application of such new area in optical communications. And for the sake of being a summer school, I will also try to give some basic stuff uh, like the gradient descent, this kind of, of detail. So if you already know this, I beg your pardon, <laughs> but that's it. So, our uh, my some overview for my presentation. I will start by motivating why, in the first place, do we need such solutions for for optical communications? Then I will move a little bit, explaining uh, about what is the neural network based equalizer. Okay, what is equalizer in the first place, and, and then what is this variant where we use machine learning to design it. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> the third is uh, I will be talking about some pitfalls in the implementation of su such solutions. You can imagine, and I will be going deeper, a little bit deeper on this, that once you take a solution for one field and try to apply it to another field, sometimes all the particularities are not transferable directly, so you need to really understand the physics and uh, how to, to implement it. Uh, it. This was a big invited paper that we wrote, uh, more or less 25 pages. So I will not be presenting all of them. I will just present one of the dilemmas in the design. Should we use regression or should we use classification? So uh, in some fields, this is completely silly question. Image classification, did I already say, did I classify? But for uh, optical communications, we have this flexibility of uh, choosing and I will give some kind of overview of the other uh, pitfalls. And to finalize this talk, I will be giving the pillars of the design of such neural networks uh, for optical communications. So in the beginning, Sergey gave me this task of uh, looking for uh, some close final product. So having this uh, industrial mindset, uh, we, we come up with those three pillars that we are always chasing. Uh, to, to design our final solution. Those pillars are performance, complexity, and flexibility. And I will conclude my, my talk, but first let me thank my supervisor, my co-supervisor Yaroslav, uh, guys from Infinero, because uh, in my Marie Curie project, I stayed half of my PhD in the industry, in, in the Infinero in Munich, and our new PhD student, Sassi Pin. So, uh, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? Uh, last year, uh, browsing on Twitter, I saw this uh, GIF, and this GIF shows the uh, subsea links in the world. So what you are seeing here can be quite simple, but in reality, this is the beating heart of data. This is what is enabling internet to exist, as we see right now, with such high data rates, in such low amount of latency. So this almost impossible infrastructure that the humankind created is somehow limited because we have a limited space to install fiber. And as all kind of transportation problems, we have some capacity, isn't it? 
So in a road with dual lane, we cannot uh, run three, three cars in parallel. The same happens uh, with such uh, infrastructures. And <coughs> I remember um, uh, 10 years ago uh, at my home, I had one mega of, of uh, speed, in, uh, speed in my computer and it was amazing. I was, going, I was playing some uh, online games and now uh, at my home I have 100 mega. So 100 times higher in just 10 years. So this is what we see, and in the period of COVID, uh, this was even more uh, clear. So this graph shows only between September 2019 and March 2020, the beginning of COVID, how the traffic grew, uh, grew uh, around the world, uh, Brazil, uh, Italy, Canada, and so on, how this traffic uh, grew so drastically. So it was really uh, an outlier. For example, Italy, we had an, an increase of almost 50% of the data requests. So imagine you are the owner of a, of a, of a company that gives this opco infrastructure, and in, five, in six months, your data rate, your demand grows 50%. So most likely you start to get worried what I'm going to do next. I'm going to install more fiber. But installing more fibers also uh, brings a huge problem, and that's, this graph is one of the reasons that now communications uh, is uh, a, a field that is a national security field uh, in all countries, not only because of military reasons, but about energy construction. So this graph shows, this was before COVID, by the way, but this graph shows that in the worst case scenario, the, the green curve, in 2030, we can consume only in terms of communications here, optical communications, uh, not only optical communications, RF as well. Uh, only in terms of communications, in 2030, we can consume half of all energy produced in the world. Half will be communications. So how can we deal with a scenario where we have a growing demand and it's not going to stop? And at the same time, we cannot start installing more fibers, more fibers, more fibers, more fibers, more fibers, because we are capitalists with a lot of money. And also, <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of money to, to deploy more fibers, more fibers, more fibers. And we have this critical power uh, constraint in our hands. So. Uh, in the field of trying to solve this problem in communications, we have a variety of possibilities. But today I will uh, just explore one of those possibilities that is the nonlinearity mitigation. So this is a classic uh, graph where this uh, capacity just means how much you can transmit, okay, it's intuitive. And uh, this dotted line is our channel limit that is uh, just uh, that, that is the cap of how can we transmit considering just the, uh, the noisy effects that we cannot recover. However, is also because before coming to the optical field, uh, optical field uh, I was in a logistic company. So as in the logistic companies, uh, some parameters can cause bottlenecks. And in optical communications, as you can see, theoretically, the dotted line, if we improve the optical power, we could achieve as, as high a capacity as possible. But we have the nonlinear effects coming from the optical fiber and the components. And this is the true transmission, transmission bottleneck that uh, even though we have the power to transmit, let's say, those nonlinear effects act like a bottleneck constraining our transmission. So my question here, and the question of my PhD was, how can we uh, mitigate, how can we solve this bottleneck, at least partially, so we can transmit more using the same infrastructure? You see? So how can machine learning help us to produce uh, the future of communications? And I know that most of you don't know, uh, or uh, don't remember, or is not aware of how communications uh, happen. 
So all data uh, uh, in, in here, I'm talking just about the digital data, they are a set of bits, zeros and ones, that uh, translate into the text that you send, the images, the selfies, and so on, the videos on Instagram. And those data uh, are mapped uh, into some kind of uh, alphabet that in here is the 16QM uh, modulation format. And this is just for the sake that instead of sending zeros and ones, zeros and ones, you can um, encode those symbols and you can transmit it now four bits at once. You see? So now in this modulation format, you can transmit more data with just one symbol. So after encoding these sequences, your digital data uh, into symbols, you uh, give this information to your trans, uh, transmitter that you tra uh, that you convert first from digital to analog and then from electrical to optical domain. And we have this kind of envelope uh, that will be tra transmitting our information to some media, to some channel. In our, in, in our case, our channel is the optical fiber that is basically described by the Manakov equation here that most of us, uh, we are aware, this equation has no analytical solution. We need to solve it uh, with some, some methods. One of those methods is the split step for here method. And in here, I just want to uh, highlight the effects that are happening inside of the fiber. The first one is the dispersion. So uh, we introduce some memory. Initially, this data is totally uncorrelated. But because of dispersion now, the neighbor ones and zeros, the neighbor symbols, now get some correlations. That's why memory is really important when we design our neural networks. We have nonlinearities, uh, of course, and we have noise, which is Gaussian. And uh, Sergei also have a, a lot of papers describing approximately with Maria Salkima uh, some sort of solutions where we divide into signal to signal, uh, signal to noise, and just noise contributions of this. So going forward, in our receiver, we apply some sort of, we receive our envelope with a lot of noise and distortions and those correlations. And in this case, I just want to show uh, a constellation with a lot of nonlinearity. And this is what we receive, which is quite different from what we, the constellation that we transmitted. And we can use some sort of, in this case, it's just a simple hard decision um, decoding to map again from the symbols to the bits, because at the end, our image, our video, our, our voice is on those bits. But as you can see, maybe I can start using. <laughs> so this cluster here that represented this uh, symbol here, now some of the points, because of nonlinearity, crossed the decision boundaries, making the errors, OK? So this is, uh, uh, this is the translation of our errors. We send one zero, and we translated this as one one, for example, OK? So uh, how can we, uh, yeah, as, you, as you can see now, the sequence is different. So how can we use deep learning to recover those effects, OK? How can we? after using some deep neural network solution, can we recall this constellation in such a way that once doing again the hard decision, we can solve this. Yeah, so the purpose of our equalizer is just to mitigate those, those deterministic and quasi-deterministic effects, okay? But when I started my PhD, I found out that our, our systems are not that easy. So for those that are aware of um, classic machine learning. If you show this picture to any machine learning scientist, the first thing that he's going to say is, oh, use some unsupervised learning, some uh, weight cl K clustering to, to do this problem, and that's it. Our problem looks much more like this, in, in which the distributions, they almost overlap, and having only the information of the symbol, the real and imaginary value of it, it's not enough features in terms of machine learning or variables to separate, to classify, to mitigate uh, in, in this problem. So this is the problem that we are trying to solve from long-haul transmission, okay? 
and we are going to use machine learning for this. But as I mentioned, we need more information. So which information is that? I already give some hints because of this version. This uh, extra dimension will be the time, okay? The time is the extra dimension that we will make possible for us to separate those constellations over time because uh, when you see like a picture, a 2D picture, we cannot create some boundaries, but making it to, uh, a three-dimensional, in the three-dimensional space, we can, it starts to, uh, it starts to uh, not force, but make the neural network to learn uh, which boundaries would be the best ones for us, okay? So the input of our neural net, deep neural network uh, equalizers is just a window vector, okay, a, a vector of memory, in which the features are the amplitude of the received constellation, so the i and q of the, uh, of the complex uh, symbol received. And then we have this amazing black box that we'll try to, to equalize and to clean our signal, okay? So by, by cleaning the signal, we can transmit more and for longer distance. Okay, using the same infrastructure. And in the literature, we have two types of those black blocks that uh, I already uh, heard people, uh, uh, previous speakers uh, speaking about it. We have the only data-driven solutions that we, we call the black box approach. And we also have the model-driven uh, approach in which we, we try to help the learning or we try to design the neural network embedding some physical knowledge that we do have from the Schrodinger equation, from the Manakov equation. So for, for the uh, only data-driven solution, uh, we have the Moodle perceptron, convolutional architectures, recurrent architectures, and the reservoir var computing. And in this presentation, I'll be showing that we tested all of them, okay? Uh, and for the MOP, it's only interesting to, to highlight this, uh, that when we deal with some uh, memory vectors, uh, the reservoir, the recurrent, uh, and the convolutional, they work really, really well with data shaped in, in this way. So this first dimension is the dimension of your batch or your mini batch, okay? This second dimension is the dimension of the time, which memory did you input to your solution. And this third dimension is the dimension of uh, the features. In this case, the amplitude of the symbols. So for, for the three last cases, they work really well with this kind of shape. But for the MOP, they are used to work uh, with just two shapes. So uh, in, in our approaches, we just flatten <coughs> Uh, the two, uh, those two dimensions, and we work with an uh, input shape like this, and this is also known in the literature as uh, time, uh, time delayed multi-layer perceptions. And one of the questions, <laughs> my, my friend Jane yeah, knows, really, uh, knows this, this really well. Uh, and one of the questions uh, that talking to, to the scientists on, on our field that they quite don't understand is that we have a multi-level set from a dense, uh, deep neural network made of MOPs, for example, and we heard in previous presentations that, oh, those are universal approximators, okay? And for hardware purposes, it's much more difficult to implement recurrent structures than feed-forward structures. And as you, I'm going to show here, the recurrent structures were giving much more performance. So they don't quite understand why if I have a function that depends on x and some parameters, and this function has the same kind of weights, no, not, sorry, not weights, uh, same kind of input, you are giving the same input for both structures. Why the recurrent is performing much better? So this is something that we are going to discuss today as well, but I don't want to we stay longer in this, <laughs> this slide. And the second one is about the model-driven approach in which we do, uh, we do have some classic algorithms that don't use neural networks or machine learning at all, like the digital backpropagation, in which 
Uh, I talked to solve the, uh, the Markov equation, we use the split step. So the DPP is exactly the, the split step in the backward uh, direction using uh, the negative coefficients of the fiber, okay? Or we have some kind of channel models that assuming some kind of approximations, we can almost solve analytically this, uh, this problem uh, under some assumptions. So how we do this? How we embed this knowledge uh, that we have on, on the physics side to, to the neural networks, we can use some unusual activation functions, not hyperbolic tangent, relu, leak relu, etc. We can use some unusual activation functions that will uh, catch the, the effects that we already know that describes our, our physics. Or you can uh, construct another type of topology. Okay, not fully connected, for example, as we already, already use plenty. Uh, so this is how you, you design some, some sort of uh, model-driven solution. I will go a little bit deeper. Can I ask this? Yes. The first one, I'm not from the field. When you do back propagation, yes. first you need the entire field, you have the and the phase information. Yes. And then you need to know something about the system. Exactly. So yes. you need parameters. So by yes. themselves, it's not easy to do back propagation. So, the classic version, you need to have the whole information about the transmission link. The fiber param parameters, the link, the link uh, uh, length of each span of your transmission. So, this is one of the drawbacks of uh, such approach. I, I will go a little bit deeper because we also propose some solution that is model driven and we could have some hints what, what are the true challenges of it, okay? So, and now I just want to recap a little bit what was uh, described by uh, Hoyt on Monday, brilliant presentation as well, uh, about the statistics of the representation of our problem, okay? So, as I said in the beginning, we have XN, our input with our transmitted symbols. The channel uh, brings some noise, some memory, and we, uh, at the end, in the receiver, we have the YN. And we added this block in Hoyt's approach, in the end to end approach, we have two blocks one in the receiver, another one in the transmitter. So, but by doing end to end learning, uh, it's quite challenging in the training and so on. And because we want to, uh, at the end of this presentation, show how a hardware solution would look like, we decided just to move forward and spend my PhD looking to this problem of post-channel equalization, okay? Where we have this equalizer that is a function of the YN with parameters theta, okay? These theta are the weights and bias of our, uh, our deep learning structure. And by having some loss and some training algorithm, we try to minimize uh, this loss. We, we, we try to get uh, the thetas that will make xn and x hat n as close as possible. And this is, of course, the mean square error described by uh, this equation. But uh, just to, to go a little bit deeper before we go to the implementation and application in optical communications, just for the sake of the school, let's go a little bit deeper in this block of training algorithms. So I really like to start these training algorithms uh, as I, I learned in the book of uh, Ian Goodfellow. The, one of the most amazing data scientists in the world, uh, his book, Deep Learning. Uh, and he started discussing uh, this uh, gradient descent uh, problem with, the new, uh, with Newton methods, okay? Really old method, really well-known method uh, that uses a second op uh, optimization, second order optimization method. So Newton method is really good when you have some sort of pathological, curves in your uh, learning landscape. So we all know that uh, this landscape is built where we have a hyper plan with all the parameters and the, this Z would be the loss function. And we try to find the minimum of it. So Newton method is this equation. And for those that know a stochastic gradient descent, it's really close to uh, what we have in stochastic gradient descent. But instead of this H uh, in, uh, inverse of H, this would be our learning rate. So does anyone knows what this, what this H mean, means? 
in the Newton method, maybe, huh? Hessian. And what the, why the Hessian in this case, the Hessian matrix is important in this case, rather than just putting some constant with, that is the learning rate. Does anyone have some idea? So by putting the Hessian, which basically is the second derivative, all possibilities of the second derivative uh, of the parameter, the loss over the parameters, the weights, we have some, uh, some method that this learning rate is adaptive now. You can, uh, the, this method learns how much will be the step that you need to give uh, to find the local mean, let's say. And in this, uh, in this structure, the Hessian uh, is the curvature and the gradient is the direct direction. And is negative, uh, so why is negative? Because we always try to go in the opposite direction of our gradient, okay? So uh, this is more or less how the Hessian uses the, the matrix Sorry, how the Hessian uses the curvature. And uh, ju just to give a little bit more insight about this, the Hessian is the curvature, and we know that the, our learning rate will be the inverse, the inverse of the curvature. So in problems that we have really sharp local minimas, what the Hessian will do, they, they will be really small. They will be really small, uh, uh, let's say, let's call learning rate. The, 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 they will make the steps of the gradient be really small because otherwise you are going to be trapped here because your learning rate is so high. So with the Hessian matrix, he makes, he, he calculates this curvature, he knows that it's really steep, and then the steps of the gradient will be really small, okay? And the same happened with set of points, for example, that, let, let's imagine that this, more or less like this, and we want to, to go here, but we have some settled region where, of course, you all know that the gradient here will be zero, almost zero. So in, the, in those cases, the curvature makes the step be much more, uh, much bigger, let, let, let's go like this, so that we can hopefully, hopefully uh, escape those flat regions in our uh, learning uh, landscape, okay? And for here, it looks like really simple. Oh, okay, please. Sorry, just a question on the method. You are comparing the second order method with the first order method. Yes, and yes. You can't really do it. I mean, the second order method means second order expansion of your functions. So yes. You it's the gradient and the next one. Yes. Now, second order method, like you just treat, is guaranteed to go into the First for convex, method, yes. yes, for yes. convex yes. regions, yeah. It doesn't matter, the trust region will find it. Yeah. Even if your problem is not convex, you find the convex part that is the minimum, not the global. But it's not the global, yeah, the for the global minimum. Mean, I mean. <laughs> first order matter is not guaranteed. Yeah, I, I will get into it, yes. It's stochastic, but it's intriguing. To just Zibu. randomly jump away from one of these settles. But it doesn't guarantee that. I mean, you can't yes. really compare those two. I don't know what I would say, right? If you got, I, mean, it's just, I, just, I, I would just it's start from birth. Yeah, it's no point. It was just because uh, the, the equation more or less looks like, but it's completely different. I agree. No, yes. I think you say that, okay, I think that's an hour that makes a constant step. I mean, that essence is what brings you to the minimum. Yes. Take it out, it's like you are going into a I mean, I will show the next slide, the pure yes. stochastic yes. gradient descent, yes. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, for, for this uh, graph, it looks like intuitive and easy, but our problem is more like this, and having some uh, initial initialization, having this Haitian to guide us will, is really important. So this is more or less, but the Haitian uh, is something, some matrix like this, and as our last speaker mentioned, uh, in uh, deep neural networks, we have huge structures, and in her case was, I think, the VGG net with 138 million parameters. And imagine doing the Hessian for such huge structure. So this matrix would be in the order of 10 in the power of 16, 4, in the power of, uh, 4 times 10 in the power of 15, 16. 
So this is why initially we don't go for the uh, Newton's method because it's so heavily computational complexity and we, we want to avoid this. And during the 2000s, a lot of research in optimization was done. And today I'm not, I'm not going to go a little bit deeper on all of those possibilities, but just the one that guys in machine learning use the most, which is the Adam uh, algorithm, okay? Which improves the first order, so it doesn't use only the first order, but it tries to guess uh, how can we avoid and how can we uh, improve the learning itself when doing stochastic gradient descent. So the trick here was to use two things. First is the momentum, which makes, uh, which basically means that we are going to have some kind of memory on the previous, uh, uh, of the previous gradients. And in this sense, uh, the, the goal of having a momentum is that we want to speed up the convergence and also uh, in the hope that when we have some local minima, really goes to another local minima or even a local minima, this momentum can make us, so imagine we are learning here, so initially without this, uh, this contribution of the learning, we would stop here, but the momentum makes us to go even a little bit further, and then we expect or we hope that this would be enough for us to jump to the, from this local minimum to another region uh, where we can find even a better, a better minimum. And the second thing that the Adam algorithm uh, included is the root mean square propagation. So, in, and this is uh, really interesting because uh, in, uh, this, uh, this line avoids us for huge oscillations. So imagine that we, we are in a, a high dimensional uh, space and we already found that some of the parameters are quite good and only one or two need to still be learned to, to reach this uh, local minimum. So instead of having all the gradients having the same set, this line, this uh, uh, RMS prop, what he did is each of our parameters, each of our gradients will have different steps so we can avoid some oscillations. So th this is basically what will happen. And this was a simple simulation Opa. showing uh, how the Adam and the RMS prop learn really well and really fast while the stochastic gradient descent with moment, just the momentum was struggling he first fell to this uh, local minima and then found the, the, the global minima. So this is more or less some background. I, I even took more time than I expected <laughs> uh, about the optimization, uh, stop, uh, optimization block of the training. Okay, so now let's uh, start uh, moving a little bit more to the optical communications, okay? So this paper uh, was born when I start talking to some friends that are completely uh, computer scientists, and uh, I, I really said, oh my God, the application of neural network communications is really tricky. So throughout this, uh, this course, and uh, most likely the PhDs, uh, students here, start learning deep learning or machine learning in general with books and courses on Coursera, YouTube, that are basically uh, based on computer vision and uh, natural language processing, okay? Our problem is quite different from those classic problems. And it's natural to, to assume that once we try to apply neural networks in our field, some strange behaviors will happen. The first thing uh, that shocked those, uh, my friends were, was this fact here. So optical communications starts with a very high accuracy. T talking to my friend, uh, I said, oh, I need a neural network that needs an accuracy at the end of 99.99%. He, I think, two, two thoughts that he had was, first, I was drunk, and the second was about, oh, this guy is using the training data set and the testing data set are the same. 
So the training and test data set are the same, so he can have such high accuracy. But in reality, communications, uh, and I, I will change, into, instead of accuracy, let's think about bit error rate. In communications, we start our equalizers with a bit error rate of 10 to the power of minus 2, 99%. And this block tries to bring this accuracy to 10 to the power of minus 4, minus 5, which is an accuracy of 99.9999% accuracy. So this is uh, really, let's say, a gray area in the application of uh, machine learning solutions in a high accuracy uh, system. And we try to, to give some hints and help researchers in this area to not fall in the pitfalls that I fell uh, in, during my PhD, okay? And what is the consequence of having such a high accuracy? The consequence is that we suffer with a lot of overfitting and local minimum, local minimum problem. Imagine that we have a loss function that already starts with this 99% accuracy. Why he would go further? It's much easier in the image classification test where we have 50% accuracy and then we go up to 89, 95%. Here, we saw a lot of other applications of machine learning with 97, 98% accuracy. So this is one of the differences. And uh, we want to map how to, how, uh, what are those difficulties and how to solve them, okay? And this is, uh, of course, intuitive. Uh, they, they, uh, many, for example, for the overfitting, ah, just use some regularizer, but it's not quite, uh, it, it doesn't quite work in our field uh, as we expect it to work when we do for image classification or computer vision, for example. And he, uh, here I just want to, to say, uh, in your field as well, when you design your solutions, which pitfalls do you need to, to look? This is not more, more general. The first is the data flow. The data flow, uh, flows are uh, some periodicity or you broke some, some kind of correlation that was important and you were not aware. And uh, I will show uh, here what, what, what I mean uh, with this data flow problem. Basically, your training data set uh, is missing uh, some important feature or you, you shuffled it, but it, uh, the order was really important. Uh, or it has some hidden periodicity that you are not aware. The second is a design flow. How did you build this uh, near net, not near network only, but this machine learning structure? Uh, did you use all the inputs that were necessary? How was the, the training? Uh, how was the output? How hidden it was? And here we have the consequence of classics. Uh, uh, bias and various uh, trade-offs uh, that you, you need to take into account when designing uh, your neural network, okay? And the third one is the learning flow. So how, how good was your training process so you can find good local minimums? We have plenty of local minimums, but our goal is to find a good enough local minimum that you are satisfied in the sense, in our case, taking the power minus four BR is a good uh, local minimum for us. So this is like an overview table in the end of our paper that uh, the first one, for example, uh, QOT metrics, uh, we found out that uh, when you measure your neural network using certain classic quality of transmission metrics, you can overestimate your result. So you, you write your paper and you go, oh, I had a, such a good result, but in reality, it was an overestimation or it can also be an underestimation of your result. And in this case, SNR produce much better results than expected when uh, indeed measuring the bit error rate, or the mutual information produce a worse mutual achievable uh, rate uh, in, in some scenarios. So uh, you, we, uh, we presented the PRBS order and data memory flaws, and this is a, uh, data flow that is really well known in, in our field. So this was not well known, and uh, it's a funny story. Uh, we did some experiment, and the experiment was outstanding. 
really good result and so on. And once we did the simulation, it was not quite the same gains uh, level. So we can uh, do two things. We don't show the simulation or we investigate why is such a behavior happening. So our option was the second one, of course. <laughs> and we realized that uh, that uh, some decks have some uh, the deck or uh, in optical, not only in optical. We have a, a memory uh, inside of a deck that repeats the data uh, after some uh, some time. And if you were not aware of this, even creating pure random data, if you don't take care of these periodic that happens internally, uh, you can overestimate uh, your results because you are almost using the same uh, data to train and to test. And that was the reason. And we, we show how to solve this problem with some uh, methodology of creating data sets for optical communication equalization. We have this regression and classification dilemma that I will tell today. We have the best size study in which uh, the minimatch uh, is well known in the books of machine learning to introduce a little bit of noise uh, and this helps us to, to, to learn and to uh, skip uh, even some local minimums. But in our field, because we have such a huge uh, accuracy level, we do need very accurate gradients uh, to, to learn. So I show here some contradictions uh, and we plot the uh, weight distributions to show uh, how these contra uh, contradictions uh, arise. And the final one is computational complexity. So this is our paper. If you are interested, you can go to check more details there. But I just want to say a few more words about regression versus classification. Because this was a huge, a huge fight among uh, big names in information theory. Because as Roy is presented uh, in, uh, on Monday, classification has a really great loss function. The categorical or binary cross entropy loss is exactly what we want to uh, minimize because minimizing this, we maximize the mutual information, and in, uh, maximizing mutual information is the same as maximizing the chain of capacity. And in, in regression, we use the mean square error that has some statistical limitations. So, uh, okay, so people before us, they were mostly using just classifications because of this intuition, and they were correct in this sense. But here, uh, and this is important to, to tell, when you bring, again, some, something from other field, and you use in our field, you need to uh, know that you bring all the benefits of having the solution that, that can learn and, and can automatically find good approximations, but you also bring all the uh, difficulties uh, of having such a gradient descent uh, solution, okay? So here, just to, to tell uh, how, we, uh, how we did this comparison, uh, we did for multi fit four layers and the current layers, uh, both had the same uh, behavior. And the difference between regression and classification in terms of the neural network structure is just two. The first one is the output in which is the real for regression. We are uh, recovering continuous variables, okay? So it's real and imaginary value. And for classification, we are trying to classify into a discrete alphabet, the, the constellation that I showed in the beginning. So the number of outputs here uh, are the probabilities for being each symbol in this, one, in this constellation. So we train, we optimize the hyperparameters uh, individually just for the fairness because uh, besides this the second thing that is different is the loss function this one is mean square error this one is categorical cross entropy loss and this is uh, one of the results <laughs> so in classics and this was uh, the huge uh, discussion scientific discussion that happened when we were publishing our, our, our journal paper is that the classical AWGN channel, I think 15 years ago, uh, it is well known that when using nonlinear equalizers and optimizing this using the mean square error, okay, this is the mean square error that we are learning for a multilayer perception, for example, you take the weights, this is the val validation loss, you take the model that produces the lowest loss, 
and our constellation in this point look more, uh, more or less like this. So this we so this renamed uh, Agile window. Okay. So uh, now we say that the uh, neural network is perverting the constellation Gaussian-like constellation to this J window effect, and this is more. This is the classic. What classic said says uh, the uh, light blue is what a uh, AWGN channel gives you in terms of performance. This is achievable information rate. Okay, think about performance. And the blue one is uh, this one. So 15 years ago, it was well known in the information theory field that please don't use mean square error because you are going to underestimate your result in this way. So it's not a good solution for our problem. But again, when, once you bring the machine learning to our field, we need to think uh, uh, differently. And the solution that I, I gave to, to, to this problem was instead of checking the validation loss uh, in terms of mean square error, let's check the validation loss in terms of the achievable rate, the mutual information. And as you can see, uh, at some point here, the achievable rate was the maximum, and then it drops because the neural network was uh, perverting the learning, because the goal here was reduce as much the distance between the symbols. And to do this, they make this kind of a perversion in the constellation. So now, using a early stopping uh, mutual information, we can then solve this problem and have exactly the same as the ideal problem. So this uh, this was the first uh, reason to, to show, guys, let's now use regression models with early stopping this way to train our uh, neural network equalizers instead of using classification. Okay, so this is uh, one of the pitfalls. And I just want to show the, the drawbacks for communications, regression, and classification. When we use the mean square error loss, this is really well known in, in the literature. Uh, we assume that we have a Gaussian likelihood. And in the beginning, I, I, I mentioned that our optical uh, transmission is quite more different than this. We have some um, noise to uh, signal interaction. But in here, we just, uh, when we assume the regression, we say that we are going to recover the deterministic part. And this is stochastic part. We approximate like a, a Gaussian uh, distribution. And the drawbacks uh, in classification is much more, much more flexible uh, in this sense. Uh, but uh, in classification, uh, in categorical uh, cross entropy loss, we don't, uh, for example, Differentiate misclassification uh, and misclassification. Uh, uh, sorry, misclassification occurrences, which in the sense is, if I have this guy and I misclassify with this guy or this guy, they will account as the same. And intuitively, when you think here, you would say no. If I misclassify this guy with this guy that's much distant, it should be a little bit higher penalty to force the. Uh, the neural network starts to move from, from this really bad uh, classification. The second one is a big area in machine learning uh, as well, showing that the cross entropy loss have really sharp local minimums. So, mean square error has more local minimums than cross entropy, but the uh, local minimums on the mean square error are much more wide and simpler to, uh, to avoid. Five minutes only? Oh my God! <laughs> I am. I have a hundred. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, th those are the drawbacks. <laughs> and uh, in reality, uh, this is basically the result. Uh, the red one is the uh, regression based with the uh, mutual information early stop, and the classification one uh, is using the categorical. And we had a much more gain in terms of, of performance, this is performance, using the, the uh, regression model. And this is a, a little bit uh, intuitive as well, because for classification, we use the incorrect labels to train our, uh, our system. 
And as I said, in our case, we have a huge high accuracy system. And uh, for example, with 260 symbols, the regression was using all of them to train the, the, the neural network, while for, uh, for the classifier, because we have high accuracy uh, levels, this produced only 1.5 thousand symbols uh, of errors, and this was not enough to, to produce uh, the learning. And the consequences of this, just to finish this, is, uh, is that the gradients, or, uh, at some point, we observed that the gradient norm of the mean square error was much higher than the ones produced by the, uh, the classifier, and that's why they uh, stopped learning. Because if I have such a small uh, gradient when you are uh, updating your rates, you just don't change them. Uh, it's not changed, it's stop learning. Okay, this was the consequence. And just to think, it's one hour already. No way. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was going to be from boy here. <laughs> but uh, with this industrial day, uh, mindset, we've uh, followed those three pillars. We want our solution to be with a really attractive uh, performance level, so industry can uh, want, want to buy it from us. We have to produce some uh, really low computational complexity solutions, and we need that those solutions need to be flexible. So in optical communications, the system changes quite fast. So now I transmit to Italy, tomorrow I will transmit to, to London, and so on and so on. Uh, so the, our solutions need to be flexible, and uh, we need to train them really, really fast. Uh, maybe I will need to drop this. So here, Okay, so here I, uh, in the first six months of my PhD, we decided to uh, create a complex value neural network because all those transmissions, uh, all those models for the Schrodinger equation are complex values. So it's only natural to also build a neural network with complex uh, weights and complex activation functions. And uh, what basically I did here was to use a, a, a a channel model that is really good when the nonlinearity is higher, so the nonlinear distance is higher than the linear distance, and uh, we build a neural network based on these equations, okay, with complex values. So uh, this part was uh, done by these two uh, very different activation functions. This part was this neural network. This one was this one. And then to finalize, we have this exponential. So if you do by hand the forward propagation, the result here will be exactly this equation. And one of the things also in the beginning of my PhD and everybody in Aston is using uh, as well was to ask the question, okay, how many neurons, how many layers, which activation function, uh, and so on and so on. So a lot of speakers here said, oh no, we fine tune a little bit, we, we picked this one because it was already good enough for us. But we, uh, oops, we used a Bayesian optimizer. So in 2019, this was what Facebook was uh, using. Uh, the Bayesian optimizer, and I need more time to, to explain to you guys, but basically uh, the Bayesian optimizer tries to fit a Gaussian process where the, uh, we, our metric here is the uh, Q factor, is the BR, and he tries to find a set of hyperparameters that will give the lowest BR possible. So uh, here, the Bayesian optimizer uh, will find us how many layers, two, three layers, four layers, which, uh, how many neurons in each layer, which activation functions, just blue, just hyperbolic tangent, a mix of it. So this uh, Bayesian optimizer finds uh, a good solution for, uh, for us and really quick solution. In around 10, ten trials, he, uh, he gives a solution that is not most likely the optimal, but is really close to the optimal. The, the other solutions are uh, random search, really search, but this is much more computational complex. Uh, complex. Okay, so be, please use Bayesian optimizer in your solutions. Uh, this was uh, the, the result uh, here in, in Italy. We did a real transmission with Telecom Italia from uh, Torino and Chivasso. Uh, they transmitted uh, in a real legacy link, uh, random data. Uh, they gave it to us this uh, data to, for post-processing uh, of, the, 
of the symbols. And this was the gain that we produced at 2.05 dB, which is quite good because those, uh, those components here are 15 years old. So in the beginning of optical communication, the, those, uh, those, this setup is, uh, was really old and your network could, could handle not only the nonlinear effects, but also linear effects introduced by these old components. Oh, uh, okay, just to, uh, can I, oh, uh, okay. Maybe I will move from the data driven because we also did data driven. When we think about uh, computational complexity, those are the four challenges that you need to think. Storage overhead, which memory do I have to storage the weights and bias of my solution? A hardware size, and this is just proportional to the how many operations uh, do you have? Latency and energy consumption. And it's really uh, hard to, to grasp how, which, which variable or which metric can I use to more or less uh, account for all those four challenges. So in our case, we try to mathematically describe for a zoo of neural networks uh, those complexities. So I will move, uh, sorry, uh, my time is <laughs> so big. Uh, okay, so in this first, first paper, uh, we describe, uh, depending on the hyperparameters that, that you choose, the computational complexity for uh, a zoo of options. For, for, the, for example, here a lot of people is doing with reservoir, we did for the equistate uh, implemented digitally completely, but also when only uh, the linear layer is implemented and we have this uh, reservoir substract uh, in the optical domain. We have a multi set on combination of layers, uh, convolutional recurrent layers and so on. And uh, this is the paper. Uh, here is just to show that uh, uh, these metrics were, were good and were really proportional to, to, the, to the latency. Uh, okay. Ah, th this is something that I, I, I really like. That is the following. I read in the beginning of my PhD, I read a lot of papers saying, oh, we are much better than them and our complexity is, uh, is lower. But in reality, I think that a fair comparison when doing multiple type of structures is you set the complexity for all of them to be the same and then you say, how many gain or what is the performance of this solution where, where all of those topologies have the same, uh, in this case, number of multipliers, okay? So, and you see that uh, in the beginning, the best one was the CNN plus by LCM uh, structure, but once we reduce the number of com uh, computational complexity, in reality, the MOP surprised us and it was much uh, better. And this you can uh, understand and I can explain later if I had a, a little bit of time that uh, the, the MOP has much less multiplications with much more parameters. So uh, to reduce the complexity of these structures, we are just cutting number of hidden unities, number of filters, and so on. Uh, and, and in the case of MOP, we, we can uh, leverage by the fact that we can have a lot of uh, neurons and still have low complexity. That's why we have this tra transition. This is just to show the hardware, blah, blah, blah. This is just to show as well that uh, in IEEE Spectrum, uh, beginning of last year, last year, they published this showing that if we keep training in this rate, uh, the neural network size, as I said, the VHG has 138 million uh, operations. Oh, okay, sorry. At the end, so if we keep scaling this, to train a neural network, we will need one month of what New York City consumes. So this is to show, uh, yeah, I cannot do everything. Sorry to, oh, sorry. You have all coffee break. To... Yeah, so yeah. if you are, <laughs> yeah. So if you want to talk about computational complexity, implementation of neural networks, please come to talk to me or collaborate. Uh, I just want to highlight that we built this pyramid for researchers to guide them uh, which metrics do, uh, do you need to use uh, to evaluate your neural networks 
uh, depending if you are talking about a more softer level to a harder level. So when you use quantization or different types of quantizations, you cannot use multiplication anymore. You need to go to all those other metrics. And we computed uh, all the equations for all those metrics for a reservoir, for uh, a zoo of neural networks as well. Thank you so much, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah,